Coming up on Juice and Java, senior correspondent Emily Karp talks us through Orange Seed's big events. And senior correspondent Derecha Singleton explores the News House projects. Plus, senior correspondent Alex Milanowski will join us in studio to talk about cicadas emerging after years underground. All that and more starts right now. Good morning, I'm Carmela Boykin. And I'm Caleb Britt. Thanks for starting your morning with us. Let's kick things off with the squeeze. A Peace Officer Academy will begin this summer at SU to recruit more officers for the Department of Public Safety. In an email sent out yesterday, Chief Bobby Malandado announced that changes were made to the DPS training. The email also mentioned that since Maldonado's last email, there have been no biased incident reports files. The chief also encouraged students to reach out if they have any information on unreported incidents. This email comes as DPS continues their work on the recommendations from Loretta Lynch. For updates on the progress being made, students can go to DPS website at dps.syr.edu. And still on campus, Syracuse University's commencement ceremony is officially in person. There will be three ceremonies from Saturday, May 22nd to May 23rd, with each school hosting on a different day. Tickets will be available Thursday, May 6th, and each graduate will have a maximum of two tickets for two guests. The event will be following state regulations with social distancing, complete with different gates and entry times. Guests must also present a proof of vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test. The event will be offered virtually for those who cannot visit the Dome. If you've been missing the emails or need more specific information, details are on commencement.syr.edu. Also in New York, New York State residents will only be able to buy zero emission vehicles by 2035 if a bill is approved Monday by the New York Senate. Zero emission vehicles must have limit, limited or no exhaust emissions. And some examples include battery and electric and hydrogen run vehicles. If approved, the bill will support goals to reduce greenhouse gases and support renewable energy resources. This comes a week after Cuomo and 11 other governors sent a letter to President Biden urging him to enact similar guidelines for the country. Also in New York State, as more people in the state get vaccinated, New York continues to open. Limits for hair salons, barbershops, and spas will loosen to a 75% capacity next week. On May 7th, indoor dining in New York City will also increase to 75% capacity, the same as the, first of the, as the rest of the state. Fitness centers will be allowed to have a 50% capacity starting May 15th. The easing restrictions come as Cuomo has officially ended the cluster zone strategy for in-state COVID outbreaks and as New York's COVID cases have been steadily declining in recent weeks. Turning international, 45 people have been killed and about 150 injured after a stampede broke yesterday at a religious festival in Israel. According to a State Department spokesperson, multiple U.S. citizens were among the casualties of the stampede. Worshippers gathered at Mount Meron to celebrate La Bomer in an annual homage to Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochi. Despite Israel's health ministry warning of a possible COVID spike, the event was allowed to be held due to 58% of the residents uh, being vaccinated, around 10,000 people were in attendance at the festival. And moving back to New York State here in Syracuse, the weather here has been really chilly. We had snow yesterday. It's been so tricky. I'm not sure what's even for right now. It was like 35 degrees coming in the studio this morning. Yeah, hopefully, I don't know. I, hopefully it'll warm up soon. And we'll see what this brings later on tonight. Maybe some snow? Who knows? We'll see. Our weather anchor, Trey Rodfield, is live on the Citrus TV weather deck to let us know. Trey? Caleb, Carmella, hello from the weather deck. We had some snow. Yeah, we actually had some snow last night, but hey, that's why we have this thing in this world called today. As you can see, what we have right now, mostly cloudy skies and a little bit of wind here and there. Right now, we got 43 degrees with winds going westward at about 8 to 10 miles per hour, but expect the sun to pop out later in the afternoon as it's already starting its work right now. 
Moving into tomorrow, though, the sun will be the last thing that's out. We have a 50% chance of showers throughout the day, starting at around 9 a.m., with temperatures going around the upper 50s, but it won't be up that high from there. At noon, it will go up to 62, hardly even dropping down at all at 6 p.m. So 18 hours from now, we're going to look around 61 degrees. So yeah, the temperature is going to be nice, but make sure to keep that umbrella handy, Central New York. That's all I got for now, guys. I'm going to kick it back over to you in studio. Thanks so much, Trey. After the break, senior correspondent Emily Karp tells us about Orange Seed's big event. And senior correspondent Dorisha Singleton will tell you about the News House project. Stay with us. They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. Syracuse University's Freshman Leadership Program is hosting their largest day of community service. Senior correspondent Emily Carp breaks down their big event. The coronavirus pandemic left countless individuals struggling, out of jobs, and forced into economic burden. With thousands of people displaced within the last year, many individuals around the globe have strived to make a greater impact, and Syracuse University students are doing just that. Syracuse University student Sarah Frankel is a current member of Orange Seeds, a freshman leadership program that challenges students to engage with and give back to the greater struggling and hard hit Syracuse community. We do a lot of volunteer work in the Syracuse community. We cleaned up Thornton Park for one of our activities. We also did something for Hope Print for like quarantine patients we're like putting that putting together like care packages with masks hand sanitizer and we also made period packages for women who are also in underprivileged communities and they don't have access to these products Got we've it. done we're, we're we're trying to get back since 2004 orange seeds has been a staple part of initiating community service efforts within the city of syracuse every freshman cohort is given the task of planning a big event Syracuse University's largest student run day of community service, supporting local nonprofit organizations within the city of Syracuse. Past big events have included trips to the Westcott Community Center, the Salvation Army, Dr. King Elementary School, Meals on Wheels, and Thorndon Park. In planning the big events, each seed class learns how to contact local organizations, coordinate student volunteers, and work with the university in scheduling, marketing, and budgeting. Frankel tells us a little bit more about this year's big event and how you can get involved. This year's big event is taking place in the Dome. So we're partnering with a total of 14 nonprofit organizations that are home and like centered around Syracuse. And there's 
events that like will take students off campus to the site and location of where the actual nonprofit organization is and that organization will have like a list of things for volunteers to do and how they're giving back and how they're helping that organization and then in the dome for kids who don't want to go off campus we're putting together like again pair care packages i know the leukemia and lymphoma society is one of the organizations that want care packages this year's big event planned for today, May 1st, will be conducted in a hybrid format, hosted in person in the Dome and virtually via Zoom. Students who would like to participate can give back by helping with a yard cleanup with the Vera House, building and painting tables with Meals on Wheels, farm work with the Brady Faith Farm, and many more. To learn more about how you can help give back through Orange Seeds, contact the organization at orangeseeds at syr.edu. Emily Carp, Juice and Java, Citrus TV News. Thanks, Emily. Since September, a team of Syracuse University students and staff have been exploring and capturing inequality throughout Syracuse. With the recent release of News House's Deconstructing the Divide, Juice and Java senior correspondent Doratia Singleton spoke with one of the student reporters on their contribution to the project. Adriana Rosas Rivera knew she wanted to be a part of this project when she first saw the email with the working title, The Inequality Project. I'm Puerto Rican, so I come from a land that is colonized. So I live and breathe inequality, like that is what we live every day on the island. The year-long project was to figure out where in Syracuse there were still inequality issues such as racism and oppression. And I was immediately drawn to that because that's the type of story that I want to cover as a journalist. That's why I became a journalist. Rosas Rivera included two long-form articles for Deconstructing the Divide. One story was entitled, it's Not Our Hill, which focused on indigenous activists and students that say the university and state can do more to recognize the Onondaga Nation's claim to the land now occupied by Syracuse University. And her other article was entitled Voting in Silence, which focused on deaf and hard of hearing voters having difficulties accessing political information due to a few or no accommodations. I was watching the DNC and RNC last year and realized that there was no um, American Sign Language interpretation. The story of, of Native Americans is kind of the um, definition of inequality and oppression. Um, so it needed to be included. What are you most proud of out of it? Um, so I interviewed for the first time, I interviewed someone from the deaf community by using an interpreting service. I'd never done that before. Um, and then the second thing I'm most proud of was being able to kind of push SU to give us an answer on, you know, how they're going to engage with the Native American community. That the fact that they declined, like adds to the story. It really says a lot. Rosa Rivera says, even though the project is out, the importance is for these stories not to be forgotten about. I'm Daracia Singleton reporting for Juice and Java. Thank you, Daracia. When we come back, Carmela and I will try some gardening. Stay with us. Find her. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving.
Welcome back to Juice and Java. They say April showers bring May flowers, but what if we get snow in May? You know, I don't really know what it means, but hopefully it will end soon because right now is usually the start of gardening season. I know. So let's try to plant some, some flowers here. Absolutely. So we have a range of, it's a flower medley that's going on. So we're going to start by placing some dirt in this egg no. carton. Great because it's biodegradable. Yes. Fantastic. So we only have, ooh, a brief amount of time to do this. We have safety precautions to measure with the, the paper towel. Do you garden yourself back home? Um, I know my grandma gardens a lot, and so she actually has marigolds, which is kind of cool. And ooh. so, so, yeah, I would wash her plant them all the time. Do you? No, not at all. My <laughs> grandparents did, but not me. So first we put some dirt mm -hmm. in the cart right here. Next we do, well, we fill these halfway, then we pour some water. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to kind of like skip around a little bit, do these. Oh, thank you. I would say whenever I have plants at home, they always kind of end up dead. I may or may not forget how to water them. Uh, so I'm very glad that I won't be taking care of these for the near future, but I'm happy to plant them. <laughs> this is enjoyable. So first we did dirt, then we did water. Now we're going to take at least three to five seeds. We mm -hmm. have marigold. Yes, we have marigold. I've been told there's some other elements in here that are not just marigolds, but that's good. It's a mix. We like a mix. Diversity in plants <laughs> is good. Here's some more seeds. A fun kind of part about marigolds, though, is if you're planning on having, like, winter vegetables, um, they're really good to plant in the spring. They, like, cleanse the soil of a bunch of mm. bugs and things. And then when you plant your vegetables, like, mid to late summer, then the soil is all nice and prepared, so you have beautiful vegetables that don't get eaten up yes. by bugs and worms and other little pests. I feel like people who do garden a lot and take it very seriously, yeah. they're very refined and one with life and nature. So I really admire that about people who take this seriously. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely like a culture kind of thing. For sure. Have you seen in Thorndon Park, they have like a rose garden? <gasps> no, I people love a good garden, a rose garden. I don't know anything about it, except for the fact that every season there are people who come and they do all the pruning and they make the rose garden look all pretty. <sighs> So I definitely recommend you check it out if you haven't. We're kind of making like a little sandwich here. So first we had dirt, then we had water, then mm. we had the seeds. Right. And now we're putting dirt on top of the seeds. Right. Leaving it nice and airy so that way the, the plants have room to breathe, yes. room to grow and develop into cute little yes. flowers. And then the last thing is putting more water on top. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, look at the art on this pork. Do you I don't see know, me? They, look at the shot. The beautifulness of the gentleness <laughs> of just getting it all together. We have to be very gentle with the flowers so they can yes. flourish and thrive. And then, once you're done like this, with a little bit of movie magic and some time, <laughs> some love, some sunshine, they look like this. Absolutely fabulous. Shout beautiful? out to our producers for growing these. I know, um, yes. No confidence in me that I could have done this. Same. And look at how successful this is. I think of beautiful. 12, you have one that's a little, huh? And then one that's a little, eh, but other than that, looking great. Beautiful. And that's what we have for you on this segment. But when we come back, we'll talk to uh, senior correspondent Alex Malinowski. He'll break down the emergence of billions of syndicates. And Juice and Java's Ryan Baker goes to an animal park. Stay with us. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Your girls have been with you through every moment of your life. They were with you when you felt unbreakable. With you that time, you felt most alone. And with you when you realized you would never be. They were with you when you shared your love with the world. And with you when she became your world. Your girls have never left you. They're still with you right now. But how well do you know them? You don't know Knowing your breasts can save your life.
Welcome back to Juice and Java. This next story is horrifying. Honestly, what I think what nightmares are made of. A group of cicadas is finally emerging after being buried in the earth for almost two decades. I know. Juice and Java senior correspondent Alex Malinowski is in the studio to break down this phenomenon of the insect world. Yes, guys, so in 2004, I was a carefree toddler crawling through the house and playing with my favorite toys. And at the same time, billions of newborn cicadas from a group known as Brood X burrowed in the soil and began a 17-year cycle of feeding underground. SUNY ESF entomology professor Melissa Ferkey broke down the difference between Brood X and other groups of cicadas. Within cicadas, you have two groups. You have the periodical cicadas, which, e which emerge in these large masses every 13 years or every 17 years. And then you have the annual cicadas, which include the dog day cicadas. So some of them that we hear every year. So those are the two kind of big groups. And Brood X is the big group. And lots and lots and lots and lots of them emerge. Yes, and Brudex cicadas are expected to appear in at least 15 states in the coming weeks, from Georgia to New York to the Midwest. Let's take a look at this map from the U.S. Forest Service that shows us where the different groups of cicadas live. So as you see here, the bright yellow on this map highlights areas where Brudex are most heavily concentrated. And as you can see, there are three hot spots. We have Washington, D.C. and the surrounding areas in Indiana and also in Knoxville, Tennessee. And now after emerging from the ground, each of these cicadas climbs a plant and starts to shed their exoskeleton. And Ferky says these transformations are always fascinating to entomologists. Basically, you sit there and you puff up, right? You pull air in and you puff up like the Hulk. Think of the Hulk, like his t-shirt splitting open, right? And maybe you've seen these husks out there, these exuvia and they puff up and they bust out the backside. Now, after shedding their, their old skin, adult cicadas live for three to six weeks and mainly focus on mating. They participate in a process called lecking where males partake in vocal challenges to win a mate. Brudex cicadas are actually louder than the roar of a lawnmower with all of them together from three feet away. And for anyone interested in trying something new, Brudex cicadas are edible. Yet, Ferky is calling on people to act fast if they want to enjoy these yeah, insects at their best. Before their exoskeleton hardens. So if you can grab a bunch off the tree that are still soft, you know, just emerged and before they puff up their wings, maybe throw them in a baggie and put them in the freezer and then, you know, stir fry them with some butter. Yum. And Ferky says she can't imagine a cleaner thing to eat than a newly enclosed cicada, since it has only consumed tree sap its entire life. And Caleb, Carmela, I don't know about you guys, but eating insects just isn't my thing. I would say it's definitely not yes. my thing. Is it your thing, Caleb? <laughs> no. <laughs> Horrifying. <laughs> Coming up next, Juice and Java's Ryan Baker went to the Wild Animal Park. The park recently has reopened in person after being closed due to the pandemic. April 17th marked the opening day of the Chittenango Wild Animal Park. Lines formed as early as 9.30 a.m. as visitors eagerly waited to see lions, tigers, and... That's two-year-old Callum Matheson. He got to see all of his favorite animals today. Oh, you want to see the crocodiles first. The park always shuts down in the winter months, but the COVID-19 pandemic forced it to close earlier than usual. Now, visitors like Tommy McMullen can once again experience the joy in person. Honestly, never seen a lion before, so this is crazy to me. I've been to zoos before, but I've never, never seen a lion. This is surreal to me. Margaret Kinzella has worked as a zookeeper at the Wild Animal Park for almost a year now and said visitors can expect a number of new attractions. We have our black bear exhibit that's finally finished for our four black bears. Uh, we have a baby giraffe expected this summer, which we're super excited about. Uh, this is the first season we'll get to show off our new pygmy hippo and penguins. They're just finishing those exhibits. The COVID-19 pandemic may have shut down the park to visitors last year. They opened up a safari drive through to allow the park to still operate. This is the first time since then that the park is open to visitors in person. So the drive through safari is where you can take your own car. 
Uh, you can drive through our three pastures. It's a little over a mile long. Uh, you can see a couple dozen different species that we do not have over at the main zoo. The drive through was so successful during the pandemic months that it will be opening up once again in just a few weeks. <laughs> Ryan? Thanks so much, Ryan. Coming up, the five day forecast with weather anchor Trey Redfield. And the Kentucky Derby is today. Stay with us. I see you mobbing over her. Let's go. Let's mob. Let's crawl. Let's crawl. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey yo, we mobbing. Come on, girl. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey yo, let's crawl. Hey yo, let's crawl. Hey, let's crawl. Hey yo, let's crawl. Most party fouls are pretty dumb. But if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Underage drinking and driving, the ultimate party foul. Welcome back to Drill Juice in Java. Earlier we learned what we have right now, but what about this week? Weather correspondent Trey Redfield was back on the weather deck to give us our five day forecast and our current temperature. Trey? Hello again, guys. I hope you're staying warm in studio because it's a bit nippy on the weather deck right now. Let's check out the current temperatures in central New York. Looking around mid to low 40s across CNY, 43s and 44s, ironically enough, in Syracuse to be exact. Only seen on the map that only city on the map that would disagree with that though is Elmira, sitting at 48 degrees. Well, let's kick into our five-day forecast now. Tomorrow we'll have showers, as mentioned previously, high 50s, low 60s, and we start off the week with the same gloomy weather, unfortunately. High chance of showers and a possibility of storms rolling in and temperatures will look pretty nice though with a high of 69 degrees and a low of about 54 and that gloomy start will continue into the week. Tuesday and Wednesday bringing the same weather with similar temperatures. Finally for wake up weather at 9 a.m. tomorrow it'll be about 58 degrees with not too much of an increase after that. The one caveat though. The rain is inbound and is here to stay. So be sure to put that jack, make be sure not to put that jacket away. But that concludes my weather report, guys. I'm gonna kick it back over to you. Thanks so much, Trey. It's the Kentucky Derby, and Syracuse fans have something to cheer for. Local businessman Adam Wheatsman and Syracuse University basketball coach Jim Beheim have their own stakes in a horse that will be racing in the Derby. The horse, Hidden Stash, will be racing as number 13. Hidden Stash has roughly 39 to 1 odds, placing in the middle of the pack. Horse racing coverage will be available starting at 2.30 today, with the Derby schedule to take place at 6.57 p.m. And Caleb, have you ever watched the Kentucky Derby? Are you a fan? No, but I know the big hats and like the very nice suits and stuff like that. So yeah, that's similar. It. I know our producer, our executive producer, um, Sydney, is rooting for this horse. Let's 13, do it. Like it is it's her birthday, so let's all root for number thirteen. Let's do it. And that's all the time we have for you on Juice and Java this morning. Check us out online at CitrusTV.com and follow Citrus TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Also, make sure you check out our show, The Citrus TV Tap. It's yes. available on Instagram, social media, wherever you can see it. I'm Carmela Boykin. And I'm Caleb Britt. Have a great day, Syracuse. <laughs>